In celebration of Gay Pride Month, this video is for gay viewers only. If you are straight, you gotta turn the video off, go to your nearest truck stop bathroom, and... It's not Gay Pride Month. And even if it was, subjecting the LGBT community to your content is not a great way to celebrate it. In fact, that may qualify as a hate crime. Perhaps raising money for a charity for LGBT people would be of some good. Why the hell do gay people need money? I made $47 being gay yesterday. But, of course, this isn't Derek's story. This is the story of Bartolome de las Casas. As the economic exploitation of the Indies increased in the several decades after Columbus's discovery, the Spanish ended up wrestling with the Indian question. Perhaps they were just savages and possessed a slavish nature of the sort Aristotle had once written about. Or perhaps they were a perfectly fine, just misguided people who had the potential to accept Jesus into their hearts peacefully. Or maybe they were savages and natural slaves only until they drank the Jesus Kool-Aid, at which point they were now human. The consequence of this discussion was the adoption of the laws of Burgos the first legal approach to the Indian question. The most important provision in it was that the Indians were to be made Christians. They were to be assembled in villages, taught the creed, the Lord's Prayer, and how to confess. Natives who worked for wages were not to be ill-treated. Every town was to have an inspector to ensure that the settlers conducted themselves humanely. There were some less philanthropic provisions. The natives were forbidden to dance. Church-going was compulsory. Old houses were to be burned to prevent sentimentality. A third of all Indians were to work in the mine. Despite these and other such clauses, these laws began an intellectual revolution. The practical consequences were more uncertain. The year after the laws of Burgos came, the require... fuck. The requirement came into being. The requirement was a document the Spanish had to legally read to any native populations before inciting conflict. It was pretty short, and it basically just said, the Pope's in charge of the world, and we serve the Pope, so therefore you are now our subjects. The logic is, of course, foolproof. I can't argue against it. Now, I know what you're asking. How did the Spanish translate this legal and needlessly biblical garbage into the very many different native languages? That's a great question. They didn't do that because they didn't care. My headcanon is that it was a prank. A serious argument about the legality of empire was now joined in Spain. But it might not have been taken any further had it not been for a Dominican monk of persistence, courage, humanity, and eloquence, Friar Bartolomé de las Casas. Las Casas had faults, but of his generosity of spirit and his determination there can be no doubt. We must interrupt this discussion about garbage historical liars to tell you about our sponsor, Ground News. Was Montezuma an alien? Ancient astronaut theorists say, yes. They say a lot of things, and if you want to get through the biases inherent to our modern hell nightmare existence and history, you should try Ground News. I'm a centrist. Always have been. And if you're like me, you work to maintain that neutrality like your life depends on it. Ground News, developed by a former NASA engineer who left after she got bored of faking all those moon landings, is a news aggregation tool that helps you better understand stories by providing readers with an easy, data-driven, objective way to read the news. For every story, Ground News provides the individual bias and factuality ratings for each news outlet, as well as the overall bias and factuality ratings of the story, headline, and the ability to reach every article right there in the app. I can think of no better place to keep up to date on modern archaeological digs and their discoveries in Mexico. Also, modern things. Did you know that guy from Celebrity Apprentice became president? I had no idea, but it turns out he's been arrested for some stuff, and the entire story is steeped in biased reporting, and indeed, volume of reporting. According to Ground News' Arcane Eldritch Math, 33% of the reporting on that news story comes from the left, and 16% from the right. Thankfully, you can inform yourself of this developing story with Ground News, as it, like all their stories, comes with a quick visual breakdown of the political bias, factuality, and ownership of the sources reporting. This is all backed by ratings from three independent news monitoring organizations, which, unfortunately for them, do not believe that Montezuma was an alien. I have it on good authority that he was. Ground News is a fantastic tool for sifting through the daily misinformation and bias inherent to reporting the modern stories affecting our daily lives, as well as the stories affecting former reality TV show stars. I mean, 
now that I'm reading the news again, I had no idea of what's been going on. It turns out they're banning gas stoves. They're coming for our centrists. Raise your spatulas with me in rebellion. Ground News is offering all you viewers a free trial to try it out for yourselves. You can only access the trial through my link, so go to ground.news slash cobbler or click the link in the video description and support an independent news platform working to make the media landscape more transparent and with fewer ancient astronaut theorists. Las Casas was born in Spain the same year as Cortez, and their stories would become inexorably intertwined with each other and this prolonged legal and moral battle. Casas' family had been doing business in the New World before his arrival there, as his father had traveled on Columbus's second expedition, even bringing back a native slave before Queen Isabella told him that was weird. Bartolome de las Casas and Hernán Cortés are a fascinating pair. They traveled to the colony of Santo Domingo at the same time, and possibly even on the same ship, and they would spend decades crossing each other's paths over and over again in the Caribbean. The specifics are cloudy, but we do know that much later, in his old age, Bartolome de las Casas would save Cortés. There was a time when we were friends. Las Casas would end up being the first priest to give mass in the New World, and was a chaplain during Diego Velázquez's invasion of Cuba. In one of the histories that Las Casas would later write, a short account of the destruction of the Indies, which is just the, the angriest fucking shit I ever read, Las Casas mentioned the time when a chief of the Teano people, a man named Hatui, was finally caught after years of fighting the Spanish tooth and nail. He was tied to a post and about to be burned alive when a Franciscan priest implored him, Hatui, it's not too late. Yes, you will die, but if you accept the one true God into your heart, you will be accepted into the kingdom of heaven. Do all Christians go to heaven? The good ones do. Are you a good one? Uh, of course, I... Why would I want to spend an eternity with you animals. Las Casas would go on to manage his encomienda on Cuba for a time and benefit from the exploitation of Native American labor, but what he'd seen, and what he'd heard, as Hatui denounced Christianity and burnt alive, haunted him to such an extent he'd give it all up. From thereafter, he would spend the rest of his life fighting tirelessly in defense of the natives and against their exploitation. Las Casas wanted to end the slave trade, the encomienda system, the broader exploitation of labor, life, and land in the Western Hemisphere. Las Casas envisioned and fought for a gentler colonization, where natives would be educated in the ways of Christianity and European-style agriculture freely. A system built on trade and education, rather than forcing women and children to die for gold. Oh yeah, the Spanish would usually kill the grown men, then enslave the women and children, and separate them all, like move them around from each other, you know. Uh, you know, because glorious conquest. While Cortes engaged in foolish expeditions in and around New Spain, which bore little fruit in the years after the fall of Tenochtitlan, Las Casas would travel all around the New World, gathering testimonies and evidence for his legal fights back in Spain for the rights of natives. In fact, Las Casas and Cortes, now old men, would often stumble into each other in Mexico City and argue in public. There was a time when we were friends, Cortes, before the sight of gold and the taste of blood drove you mad. Render unto Caesars that which is Caesars, render unto God that which is God's. That gold is mine to keep and the blood was spilled in the name of our god, Bartolome. Don't forget that. Listen to yourself. Calling yourself Caesar. Acting as if your bottomless avarice is divine intervention. I've read your letters. The stories you told King Charles. That Montezuma prostrated himself before you. Surrendered because of some prophecy there's no record of. It was an illegal invasion of an innocent people. Innocent. These people were war-mad savages. They carved hearts from the chests of children and burn them in braziers. And how many children have died in your gold mines, Cortez? They died Christian! They died baptized in the name of- <coughs> <coughs> That is quite the cough. It's nothing. I hope so, because I'm departing for Spain with my writings. Hundreds of pages of reports of what you, Velasquez, Alvarado, Pizarro have all done. You burned through this land like a fever, and you will pay for it. <sighs> then will you? You were there with me and Velasquez in Cuba. You enjoyed the spoils of empire for a time. When will you pay, Bartolome? I pay every day of my life. 
and every night when sleep doesn't come. I pay in this life, Cortez, but you're going to have to pay in the next one. Cortez would die a fabulously wealthy liar, and Las Casas would never see him pay for his crimes. The old conquistador's death did not end the pattern of parallel petitioning. Las Casas, striding fearlessly from old age into very old age, would devote the next 20 years to an extraordinarily energetic campaign to promote his vision of righteous colonialism, the vision for which he is known to this day. Cortez would meanwhile continue to promote his legacy, but posthumously, via the hagiography written by his secretary chaplain, Francisco Lopez de Gomara, and paid for by his son, Don Martin, published as La Conquista de Mexico in 1552 the very same year that the presses first printed the destruction of the Indies. I suggest that it is more useful than contrived to imagine these two books initiating a public relations war that still continues after 464 years at multiple political, intellectual, and cultural levels and on a global scale. These videos were supposed to be about the fall of the Aztec Empire, but it has become about something much bigger. Our last video was about what money does to politics, but this video is about what politics does to history. Las Casas would often exaggerate, either knowingly or unknowingly, Spanish atrocities, particularly as it pertained to number of natives killed directly. The largest cause of Native American death in the New World was, by far, infectious diseases that the Spaniards brought with them, you know, due to all the sheep they fucked. And of course, it's not fair to judge the Spanish for that. Those sheep were very sexy. And also the nature of infectious disease was not known, and you know, you can't really judge a guy for coffin. Regardless, the exaggerations of Las Casas have been used to attack his body of work, and I believe that's short-sighted. There were gross exaggerations spread about the Spanish colonies, not just by Las Casas, but by other European nations, and we'll get into that in more depth later. But for now, when you look at Las Casas' life, a theme emerges a dedication to learning and growing kinder from that learning. He, for example, advocated for African slavery in the New World instead of native slavery, until he realized that shit was bad too. Of course, we should cancel him for these old problematic comments. I personally believe that personal growth is evil. He had the good life, and he could have spent the rest of it making money hand over fist on Native American labor, and he threw that all away so he could travel the world in a time where such a thing was exceedingly uncomfortable and dangerous, attacking the integrity and lifestyles of men much more powerful than he would ever be. Upon his death, his work was largely forgotten for centuries. Las Casas lost. Nothing we say will change that fact. When I looked at Las Casas, all I saw was a man who, despite his upbringing, despite his social circle, despite his economic surroundings, fought for a world that would never come. But Las Casas was also not an angel. He was a man who behaved decently in an indecent society. As such, he was fallible. Las Casas would say of the requirement, the silly little political theater document, that he didn't know whether to laugh or cry at the absurdity of it. This is, unfortunately, Las Casas's great failure. The requirement worked exactly as intended. Here is the commonly accepted historical narrative. The narrative brought to life in countless paintings, a garbage Netflix documentary I recently saw, and even a mural that still covers the walls of the Capitol Rotunda. To quote directly from the Capitol's website, The Spaniard Hernando Cortez, conqueror of Mexico, enters the Aztec temple in 1519. He is welcomed by Emperor Montezuma II, who thought Cortez was a god. Sick. Let's move on. I've got a whole list of new racial slurs I'm excited to try out. No. The traditional narrative, or dare we say, the Cortes narrative, states that Montezuma surrendered to the Spanish on sight, as he believed Cortes to be some sort of prophesied return of the god Quetzalcoatl. That makes absolutely no sense on even a surface-level evaluation, which is something I know you're capable of if you try really hard. So go on, just think about it. No! Come on! Put on your big boy brain and think for a second. I said no, I... Wait a second. Yeah. That doesn't make any sense. On what basis would Montezuma think that? Like, these goddamn Spaniards had been through battles. They had wounded and sick men with them. What sort of god shits himself when he gets stabbed? I mean, come on. Also, then why would Montezuma order the attack on Cortez in Cholula? Either he thought the Spaniards were gods, 
or he tried to get one over on them, both cannot be true. So there's already at least one significant lie in the narrative. Also, historically, religion is used to enforce the power structure of the man pushing it, not to give up power to someone else. What sort of ruler would use religion to delegitimize himself? I mean, come on. Did the other monarchs not tell Montezuma religion was just a prank that they pulled on the poor people? Yet therein lies the rub. Montezuma did not surrender to Cortes. It is neither plausible that he did, nor easily reconciled with the images and evidence of him as a ruler that survived from the early 16th century. Indeed, the emperor who voluntarily gave up his empire is particularly difficult to reconcile with the king of the cannibals. This is our third knot, the meeting knot, and it's a fucking nightmare. It is due to this knot that this entire video is knots, and I want to fucking die. There are two plausible explanations for what occurred when the two men met on November 8th, 1519. The first explanation is simple. Cortes lied for money. Cortes did not read the requirement, and he was not authorized by any legal power to wage a war of conquest. The surrender of Montezuma makes no sense with what we know now, but it was a very convenient explanation for Cortes at the time, as well as an explanation that would have fed European narratives of superiority. The story is seductive to the mind of a European. The conquistadors were oftentimes very impressed with Aztec architecture and urban planning, so Montezuma pussying out on sight and thinking Cortes was a god would help Europeans ignore, you know, all that shit. The impressive shit. If even the victims of colonization recognized European superiority, well, then that superiority was basically unquestionable. Welcome to my kingdom. Would you please steal all my shit? Oh, are you sure? Yes, I love it when shit is stolen from me. As said in the last video, fewer than 25 Spaniards in Cortez's initial expedition would survive to tell the tale. And of course, God only knows how many were within earshot. Beyond that, Cortez had a grip on the narrative. His letters back to Spain were famous and widely circulated throughout the whole continent, and the aforementioned history written by Gamara would be posthumously published and also quite popular. And this is the important part. Let us read from a letter written by Queen Isabella of Spain to the governor of the Spanish Caribbean in 1501. Because it will be necessary to take advantage of the service from the Indians in mining gold and other tasks we have ordered done, you are to require the Indians to work in the things of our service, paying to each the salary that seems fair to you with regard to the quality of the land. I love this bit. It's nestled in the middle of a letter talking about how good and virtuous and Christian the new governor's behavior must be after the bloody fucking mess Columbus had made of his governorship. Isabella decreed that all natives were Spanish subjects and had yet to be given a chance to be Christian and therefore cannot be enslaved. Muslims, oh yeah, sure, they had a chance to be Christian, but these natives didn't even have one yet. So non-Christians could be enslaved, but who else could be enslaved? Rebels. The purpose of the requirement was to force natives who had no idea what the fuck was going on into becoming rebels. The requirement was not a joke. It was not an odd little absurdity from a foolish age. It was a calculated, legal tool that the entirety of the Spanish system of colonization would end up depending on. But Cortes could not read the requirement. He didn't have the right to do anything like that. He needed the Aztecs to be rebels, and they could only become rebels if their king surrendered on sight. As then, Cortes isn't conquering shit. He's putting down a rebellion in Spanish territory, like the good Christian boy he is. The lies of Cortes have survived for centuries because those lies served power on both a moral and material level, and therefore needed to be true. The logic is circular and only breaks with perspective. Computer, what does circular logic mean? I don't even have the normal kind. Montezuma surrendered because he was inferior. And he was inferior because he surrendered. Both of these things are true, or neither are true. And make no mistake, it is the latter. During his 17 years as Huey Tlatuani, Montezuma faced his share of natural disasters and man-made threats to his empire. There were famines three years, earthquakes in three others, and one brutal snow-filled winter. Roughly a third of his military campaigns were against towns or provinces rebelling against Aztec tribute demands. Yet the fact remains that not only did he survive in office, but the empire persisted and continued to expand. So what happened if Montezuma wasn't a huge pussy? He definitely did just meet with Cortez and let him walk into the city, and according to Cortez and Diaz, they were treated as honored guests. What's the deal with that? As you have gathered by this point, Montezuma is 
inconsistent. At times hostile to the conquistadors, at times guarded, at times friendly. Of course, the explanation for this inconsistency is obvious. I shouldn't even have to say it. I mean, it's obvious to you, right? You aren't a commoner, are you? These videos are not made for peasants. They are made for well-bred, classy aristocrats with big boy chins and cousins for parents. You filth! This is the second explanation for Montezuma surrendering to Cortez. It is based not in Cortez lying, but rather him misunderstanding. Nahuatl, the language of the Aztecs, was much like their actual society, incredibly hierarchical. Nahuatl, among the upper classes, particularly when it came to diplomacy, was an insanely formal language with lots of weird rules and doublespeak and underhanded meanings. I assume the peasants just communicated by farting into each other's mouths or something. La Malinche, thankfully for the Spanish, was the daughter of Aztec aristocrats, which meant she could understand this bizarre rich boy doublespeak. Montezuma welcomed Cortez with open arms and said Cortez could have his kingdom. Is that surrender or politeness? When you let someone else into your home and say, hey, my house is your house, la casa es su casa, does that mean they're allowed to have all your shit? Or are you just being nice? The Aztecs ruled through fear. The Aztec Empire was, in practice, a collection of city-states who owed tribute to the Aztecs and could basically rule themselves independently as long as that tribute keeps arriving on time. That tribute also could be perceived as just protection money. The system does not work if the big man in the big chair appears weak. In fact, it was basically open season for many of these city-states when an Aztec emperor, or Huey Tlatoani, great speaker, dies. They would often capitalize on that period and try to seek independence and stop paying tribute, and the new emperor usually had to put down a bunch of rebellions first thing. You should keep that in mind, by the way. What happens after an Aztec emperor dies? Regardless, turning away 250 wounded guys and some Tlaxcalteca who had been longtime holdouts against the Aztecs would make Montezuma look very weak indeed. The Spanish tendency to engage in a kind of total war, ideologically justified, aimed at unconditional surrender with civilians as legitimate targets, destroyed pre-Columbian restraint. Contrary to the Aztecs' reputation for bloodthirstiness, they shared with other Mesoamericans a culture of warfare that was bound by a war season, by rules of conduct, and by an emphasis on individual combat and ritualized killing. Unlike the Iberian Peninsula, the Mexican countryside was not studded with castles and fortified towns. By and large, both urban and rural populations did not need to live in fear of sudden attack, slaughter, and enslavement. Not until 1519, that is. Strength to the Aztec was one and the same with decorum and generosity. Their warfare was restrained by political and social convention, but to Europeans at this time, this would be perceived as weakness. We don't know what happened on November 8th, 1519, but I think it's fair to say the accounts of Europeans which have survived reveal more about the men who wrote them than it does Montezuma himself. War in Mesoamerica before Spanish arrival didn't need a moral justification, and was fought exclusively among the warrior class, who held a privileged position in society. Whereas to the Spanish, you give a peasant a sharpened hoe and tell him to kill everything that moves. So European warfare was much more destructive, but required moral justification as a consequence of that. Whereas pre-contact Mesoamerican warfare was a fairly polite affair. You don't need to talk about how you're spreading democracy if it's just some rich boys in a fucking Thunderdome. Please God, let's go back to that. We will get into what they did to prisoners of war later. It's gonna be a fucking yikes for me, holy shit. This massive difference between the Spanish and Mesoamerican approaches towards warfare lies at the heart of the Cortes myth of Montezuma's surrender. Montezuma could not imagine the Spanish intention of killing him after being welcomed as guests nor indeed the fact that the Spanish were looking for an excuse to justify killing him. Whereas the Spanish could not imagine warfare as anything but an all-out, no-holds-barred massacre, which therefore necessitated a moral justification as a consequence of its overwhelming destructive power. Montezuma greeted Cortes kindly not as a show of weakness, but rather strength. By this diplomatic display of kindness and humility, he showed that he did not fear them and was in control of the situation. It's quite possible Montezuma even anticipated the Tlaxcalteca in Spanish 
were going to ask to become a part of his empire in exchange for protection, much like Cholula had. From his perspective, that's where this shit was going. Why else would they just come up and say hi? The smoking gun in the Cortez lie is this. Montezuma, in a show of humility, typical of Nahuatl diplomatic talk, <laughs> opened his robes and showed Cortez his stupid sexy body. It's more important than it sounds, I promise. Your subjects say you are a powerful god, is what they say true? Oh, that's just what we tell them as a prank. Look upon my body! My eyes! See, I am flesh and blood, Cortez, just like yourself. Although I must say, you clearly don't do enough lateral raises. Your lateral deltoids look hella underdeveloped, brah. You see that I am composed of flesh and bone like yourselves, and I am mortal and palpable to the touch, at the same time pinching his arms and body with his hands. See, he continued, how they have deceived you. It is true I have some things of gold which my ancestors have left me. All that I have is at your service whenever you wish it. I'm now going to my other houses where I reside. You will be here provided with everything necessary for yourself and your people, and will suffer no embarrassment as you are in your own house and country. Does that sound like surrender? or a friendly welcome into a home. Montezuma seemed to be emphasizing not that the Aztecs were subservient to Cortez, or that Cortez was in any way, shape, or form a fucking god, but rather that they were equals and welcome guests. It's a pleasure to finally meet you, Montezuma. I've brought you a gift, a necklace of fine beads. Can I hug you? Why the fuck would you hug me? Ooh, that's a good question. Maybe I attempted to embrace you so as to test your bodyguards. Or maybe I'm just a hugger. I don't know, I'm Catholic. You want to get married? Please, stop. Anyway, as long as you don't try that shit again, uh, welcome to my kingdom. You are at home here, now after your long travels, so we have prepared your quarters. I hope you will find the palace to your liking. I must insist on your presence at dinner, as you are, of course, our honored guests. Oh, that sounds good. What's for dinner? Dogs or humans? Uh, barbecue, actually. But, you know, I can ask the chef to make something just for you, you fucking weirdo. According to Diaz, the expedition was treated to smoked meat, and corn tortillas upon their arrival. Corn tortillas were a central component of the Mesoamerican diet. I don't know why I use that in the past tense. I mean, like they still are. Furthermore, barbecue was an overall common New World method of cooking, which Columbus had actually encountered before in Hispaniola. Due to this, there is a parallel universe where the traditional Thanksgiving meal is a nice smoked brisket, and the fact that we do not live in that universe is the source of my suicidal ideations. Regardless, this is the part of Diaz's account where things just start happening. Suddenly this, out of nowhere that. It's like the logic in the narrative stops working. You get what feels like half a story and it's very frustrating. Yet nestled within that half a story is incredible things that seduce you into buying the whole deal. For example, Diaz sees a rattlesnake. He calls it a snake with a bell on its tail and that's fucking adorable. At this point in the story, I wanted to believe Diaz, and yet I was struggling to. Things stop making sense in the traditional narrative, and a story that doesn't make sense is just a list of things occurring which don't naturally flow. At least, that's what my creative writing teacher told me before I had to do... things... to pass the class. I killed him with a big rock. Anyway, in the last part of this project, we explored Cortez, Spain, the broader legal system and economics and cultural forces at play in the Spanish New World. In this part, we are exploring a much more difficult question. What remains of Montezuma, the cannibal king, the noble savage, the heir to a great empire, and the pussy who gave it up to 250 dumbass investors and their rowdy friends? What is key to understanding Montezuma is that Aztec power was, in actuality, very delicate. It was predicated on their military effectiveness, shrewd diplomacy, and smart political marriages. To put it simply, Aztec power was one and the same with their perceived ability to dole out favors to their friends and defeat to their enemies. Those allied with the Aztec were allied to them for the same reason that Western Europe pretends to not hate America. Because we bought that half of the continent at a steep discount after all that Hitler business was taken care of. Oh yeah, and also because proximity to power is, for those that cannot hope to achieve that level of power on their own, very much power in its own right. But that sort of loyalty that those sort of favors buy is very fickle. As the Spanish were not a monolith, but rather a group of bickering politicians, priests, and investors, 
This is also the case with Mesoamerica. Montezuma wanted to bring the Tlaxcalteca under his control and reassert authority in the region after these weird white guys showed up. The Tlaxcalteca wanted to regain the influence that they'd lost to the Aztec, those forced by military defeat to give tribute to the Aztec, like the Totonac of Sempoala, wanted to stop paying tribute to the Aztec, and those allied with the Aztec would dump them like a fat sack of crack baby in a McDonald's dumpster the second they thought they'd gain more by attaching themselves to a different power. When the sinking ship of empire goes down, you will often find that only the captain ever remains. Regardless, you better stop writing that suicide note, because we're finally done with politics, for now. Tenochtitlan impressed the Spaniards beyond belief. The city lay on several islands in Lake Texcoco, but the city had expanded beyond the islands using posts and mud to build new land. The city can best be compared to Venice, as it had great canals through which people navigated, but make no mistake, Venice was Bush League. Cortes would say in his letters that Tenochtitlan was comparable in size to Seville, the largest city in Spain. Of course, he was absolutely off base. It was around the size of two Sevilles put together. The only means of reaching the city were three massive bridges, and on the occasions Diaz compared the city to European ones, he always makes Tenochtitlan out to be superior. The grand courtyards, the massive markets selling beautiful artwork and jewelry, but the only thing more impressive than the city was the man who ruled it. The great Montezuma was magnificently clad in their fashion and wore sandals, the soles of which were of gold and the upper parts ornamented with precious stones. So Montezuma had pimp sandals. You are welcome. I must now speak of the skilled workmen whom Montezuma employed in all the crafts they practiced, beginning with the jewelers and workers in silver and gold and various kinds of hollowed objects, which excited the admiration of our great silversmiths at home. There were other skilled craftsmen who worked with precious stones and beads, and specialists in featherwork, and very fine painters and carvers. We can form some judgment of what they did then from what we can see of their work today. Mesoamerican feather artwork is incredible, and the feather artworks made after contact are particularly fascinating. As you can see, European and Mesoamerican styles combine in oftentimes beautiful works. And this feather painting, for example, is notable in that it was commissioned several decades after our story by Montezuma's nephew. There are three Indians now living in the city of Mexico who are such magnificent painters and carvers that had they lived in the age of great painters of old, or of Michelangelo or Beruguet in our own day, they would be counted in the same rank. Beyond that, Montezuma had a massive aviary filled with beautiful birds of paradise, as well as smaller aviaries for birds of prey. Extensive gardens fed by the aqueduct which brought clean mountain water to the city, countless artisans, craftsmen, and a massive zoo complex. But wait! And I must also mention, with all apologies, that they sold many canoe loads of human excrement, which they kept in the creeks near the market. This was for the manufacture of salt and the curing of skins, which they say cannot be done without it. I know that many gentlemen will laugh at this, but I assure them it is true. I may add that on all the roads they have shelters made of reeds or straw or grass, so they can retire when they wish to do so and purge their bowels unseen by passers-by and also in order that their excrement shall not be lost. So that's crazy. Uh, okay, what else? Oh yeah, Matthew Rostal thinks that Montezuma wanted to keep the Spaniards as pets. Montezuma Zoo, his aviary, his vast incredible gardens, were these mere symbols of wealth or a symbol of something much greater? These collections included shells, birds, animals, just goddamn everything that the great Aztec Empire's influence and trade networks and tribute system could allow them to get their hands on. I could continue classifying, listing, and detailing for many pages the innumerable things collected by Montezuma. But the point is made, he was a collector. More than that, he was a collector imperial and extraordinaire, one of the great collectors of human history. Collecting was at the very heart of his identity as emperor. I'm trying really hard not to bring up Rome again, but, well, you know the saying. When all you've got is a hammer, everything looks like another troublemaker who should be nailed to a cross. Jesus deserved it. Stay woke. Anyway, to the Romans, 
exotic animals were the most delectable fruits of empire. Showing them off in many ways, from triumphal parades to public games, the animals the Romans had access to were a point of pride of power, a display of dominion over nature and her creations. Salve, Femina. Wanna check out my villa? Uh, no. My husband would kill me. Literally, he's legally allowed to kill me. Damn. Guess I'll just have to ride this big gray dick-nosed creature home alone, I guess. Oh, well hold on. When you take a closer look, a picture begins to form of what empire meant to the Aztecs how their power was maintained, and what they perceived to be the greatest benefits of this power. Montezuma collected plants, shells, animals, and yes, people. Women, as well as... Invalids? Is that the right term? Fucking little people and shit. You know, birth defects, you know what I mean. I, I don't... I don't know what you're supposed to say. Short guys. The Spanish would even go so far as to say the Aztec purposefully created these sorts of people that Disney does not like to hire by breaking bones at certain stages of growth. He was not a bookish zookeeper, timid and retiring, but a fearless master collector, a bold zoological imperialist. In other words, this emperor was clothed. Montezuma housed the Spaniards right next to the imperial zoo complex with the women, diversity hires, and birds and animals that too stood to represent the Aztec, and by extension, Montezuma's mastery over the natural world. Is it unbelievable that Montezuma was actually collecting the Spaniards? The Spaniards would certainly collect many natives. Cortes would send many natives and animals back to Europe, with many of both being shown off. Simply put, I find this idea, if a little far-fetched, far more convincing than the narrative that is right now, as we speak, painted upon the Capitol Rotunda's walls. Granted, I'd probably find whatever that ancient alien show says about Montezuma more convincing than the whole surrender on sight thing, but still. But the Spaniards could not be contained for long as novelties, as new subjects of study in the zoo collection complex. They were too numerous, too dangerous, and too savage. Do you know what just happened? We have spent 30 minutes trying to figure out what happened during a meeting, and we're still not quite sure why. Well, it turns out people lie, or so I've been told. But this goes beyond lying. Yeah, Julius Caesar said a lot of untrustworthy shit about the Gallic Wars because he was in a difficult political position and had to justify it, but he didn't say that Vercingetorix handed him a bottle of lube and a jackhammer the second he showed up. Let's call this what it is. It's a cover-up. A conspiracy. What exactly is going on here? Who made this shit so hard, man? I want names! Do you realize how long this has been? We're like two hours into this. I forgot how sleep works. I keep laying in the bed the wrong way. We're now two hours into the nightmare. And what we've been focusing on so far is why. Why did Cortez lie? Why did the crown buy that lie? Why did Montezuma's behavior provide an opportunity for this lie in the first place? But now, thankfully, we're done with why. In the next video, we finally begin exploring how. How the Spanish found a new world and buried it.